Welcome back to Spoonful of Sugar. Today's episode is recorded by Juaniza Muhiz, a rising fourth-year medical student at the Drexel University College of Medicine. She's going into OB-GYN, and today's episode will be about placental abnormalities. If you are a third- or fourth-year medical student who has recently taken Step 1 and are interested in recording an episode for Spoonful of Sugar, please reach out to us via contact at spoonfulofsugar.org, and we'd be happy to have you join our team. Enjoy the episode. Hey, future doctors. Thanks for tuning in to Spoonful of Sugar, a podcast made by medical students for medical students to help the medicine go down. My name is Juaniza, and I'm a student at Drexel College of Medicine, and I will be your host today. I'm a third-year medical student going into ob so today we'll be covering some reproductive topics, including placentas, postpartum hemorrhage, and ectopic pregnancies. First, I'd like to go over the GP system, or the gravity parity system. I know I find this really confusing, and no one really explained it to me. Um, so G is for gravidity which is how many total pregnancies, including abortions or miscarriages. And the P, or the four numbers after it, stand for T-PAL. So term pregnancies, preterm pregnancies, abortions, and living children. If someone is currently pregnant on their fourth child, they are G4P3. So that's a good way to remember it. So let's start some cases. Our first case is a 30-year-old female who presents at 35 weeks with altered mental status and painful vaginal bleeding, On exam, you can see that her eyes are dilated. What are you thinking about? So this is a woman who's pregnant, but her eyes are dilated and she's kind of altered. So you could think about maybe some drug usage, specifically cocaine, and she's having painful placental bleeding. So this was previously a normal pregnancy, but now she would have things like super bad back pain or some heavy vaginal bleeding that's painful, so you'd be looking at abruptio placentae. So this was previously a normal placenta, but then you added a risk factor such as trauma or a vasoconstrictor such as smoking or cocaine, hypertension, preeclampsia, which cause endothelial dysfunction, low placental perfusion, ischemia, or infarction. So some of the signs you're looking for are focal back pain, distended uterus, or high-frequency contractions, uterine tetany, essentially. This is an emergency. The placenta is detached. Fetus is hypoxic. So most of the times, you'll use the massive transfusion protocol. You'll give them packed red blood cells and platelets and fresh frozen plasma. What is the high-yield associated complication of placental abruption? So DIC is a common complication. It's due to tissue factor being released in response to the deciduous bleeding. Other complications could be hemorrhage, hypovolemic shock, renal cortical necrosis, and fetal demise. Say you have a 29-year-old female who has a normal spontaneous vaginal delivery. However, she is now hemorrhaging and the placenta failed to detach. What are you thinking about? So this would be a morbidly adherent placenta. This is due to a defective decidua basalis. The placental villi will implant directly into the myometrium. There's three types. So there's a placenta accrete. So that's when it attaches on the myometrium without penetrating. There's the placenta increta, which goes into the myometrium. And there's placenta percreta. Percreta is similar to perforates, so it invades the uterine wall rectum, and bladder. The risk factors you're looking for is a prior C-section or a uterine surgery. So sometimes the placenta will actually implant over the uterine scar from previous surgeries. Similarly, a DNC because you're losing your healthy endometrial layer or a prior placenta previa. Um, You can diagnose this on ultrasound prior to delivery, but, you know, 50% of these are not caught And so if it's during delivery, you'll see a placenta that won't separate during post-delivery and you'll get postpartum bleeding. Um, Postpartum hemorrhage puts you at risk for Sheehan syndrome, which is basically pituitary hemorrhage and uh, loss of all your pituitary hormones. So say you have a 29-year-old female. She presents eight months pregnant due to to, to sudden onset heavy vaginal bleeding and non-painful contractions. What are you thinking about? She has like bright red blood. 
So this would be a placenta previa. Usually the placenta is presenting prior to the baby. In these situations, the fetus is not in any distress. The placenta is attached to the lower uterine wall. And basically placenta previa is for placenta presenting. So the placenta is over the cervical os. So your risk factors would be things like multiparity, uh, previous C-section, so once again, you know, the uterine scarring, or a prior placenta previa. This can be painless vaginal bleeding anytime after 20 weeks. Uh, you diagnose this by transabdominal or transvaginal ultrasound, and your goal is to get the baby to term. So if this is before 36 or 37 weeks, you're trying to keep the mom kind of on bed rest and get her to 36 or 37 weeks in order to have a C-section delivery. If you have to deliver preterm or less than 36 weeks, you want to give the mom steroids and you want to check for GBS, so prophylax with penicillin if necessary. Um, your risk with a normal labor is you can actually shear the placenta off the cervix and lead to a massive maternal hemorrhage. So maternal hemorrhage is a high yield complication of most of these placental disorders. You cannot do any internal exams, no internal monitors, and no, nothing penetrating uh, into the cervix or near the cervix, so no intercourse as well. So say you have a similar case scenario. It's a 30-year-old female, and she has painless vaginal bleeding, but you do the fetal Dopplers, and there's fetal bradycardia and distress. So this is a vasa previa or a vasculature previa. The fetal vessels are presenting, so they're lying over the cervix. Uh, this is an emergency, so this would be an emergency C-section. You can't you know, get mom to term or wait anymore. Your risks are some vessel ruptures, fetal death, or fetal bradycardia. Vasoprevia is when the cord inserts on the choriamniotic membrane rather than the placenta, uh, so it's unprotected by the Wharton's jelly. So say you have a mom and after normal delivery, the mom becomes hypotensive, 70 over 30, lethargic, has a boggy uterus and cold extremities. What are you thinking about? So you'd be thinking about a postpartum hemorrhage. The best way to think about the different causes of postpartum hemorrhage are four Ts. So tone, trauma, thrombin, and tissue. And I'll go over each of these. So the number one cause is tone. This is uterine atony. So you have a boggy uterus from prolonged labor. So your first step in this situation would be to do a fundal massage, keep the oxytocin on, um, the first medication that you can give is transoxemic acid, which is an antifibrinolytic. The next one is methyl ergonavine. The major contraindication for methyl ergonavine is hypertension because it's a smooth vessel vasoconstrictor. The next thing you can give is hemabate or carboprost. So this is a prostaglandin analog, a PGF2-alpha. This is contraindicated in asthma. The next you can do is an intrauterine balloon tamponade um, to manually block the bleeding. And finally, you can do a uterine artery embolization, which is a procedure usually done by interventional radiology. Your next T is for trauma. So this could be any lacerations, incisions, or uterine ruptures. This risk is a lot higher when people have macrosomic baby. So what maternal risk factor would put you at risk for a macrosomic baby? Babies of diabetics are at risk for macrosomia. So your risk with trauma is a uterine rupture. So you could have abdominal pain, vaginal bleeding, um, fetal heart rates are abnormal or loss as a fetal station. Um, this is if it was pre-delivery. You can have diminished contractions if the uterus ruptures. And fetal parts can be palpable through the abdominal wall. If the trauma is a laceration, you want to just suture the laceration manually. Risks for a full uterine rupture would be prior uterine surgery, uterine distension from, you know, a multiparity pregnancy, such as twins, or tetanic contractions, so, you know, from oxytocin use. The third T is thrombin, so causes of a thrombin uh, hemorrhage would be coagulopathy or DIC. Fibrinogen is normally high in pregnancy, so you would want to look for low or normal fibrinogen, and you want to treat this with packed red blood cells. You can also give fresh frozen plasma to increase the patient's INR. The last cause of maternal hemorrhage would be tissue. So this would be retained products of conception. Uh, this can usually happen from an adherent placenta, so placenta accreta, increta, or percreta.
So say you have a 24-year-old female with a history of chlamydia and pelvic inflammatory disease presenting with severe left lower quadrant pain with rebound and guarding. What are you thinking about? So this could be an ectopic pregnancy. This means the fertilized ovum is somewhere other than the uterus. Most commonly, they implant on the ampulla of the fallopian tube. Other less common locations, it can implant in the abdomen, the ovary, or even the cervix. If it ruptures, you'll actually get fluid into the uterine cavity. Ectopic pregnancies, when they're on the right side, can be mistaken for appendicitis. So you want to look for a palpable mass on exam or cervical motion tenderness. Usually it's abdominal pain. They'll have a history of amenorrhea. You can have vaginal bleeding and hypovolemic shock if it is ruptured. Some risk factors are infertility, pelvic inflammatory disease, cartaginer's syndrome. The diagnosis is usually made through a pregnancy test. So you can do serial beta HCGs and the beta HCG will increase at a slower rate than if it was a viable pregnancy. Similarly, you can do a transvaginal ultrasound and you won't see a uterine pregnancy. Your treatment, if it's caught early, can be methotrexate. So methotrexate is a folate antagonist. What lab do you want to check if you are prescribing somebody methotrexate? So you want to check their LFTs. Methotrexate can be hepatotoxic. Some other side effects of methotrexate are mouth ulcers, pulmonary fibrosis. If the ectopic pregnancy is not caught early, you can do a salpingectomy or an ostomy and remove that part of the fallopian tube since it's usually in the ampulla of the fallopian tube. So just a quick, you know, rapid fire overview. If you have a patient with painful pregnancy, vaginal bleeding, you want to look at a placental abruption versus you could be also having a uterine rupture. A uterine rupture would be more palpable. You would feel fetal parts. Uh, you would lose, con you know, viable contractions. Whereas a placental abruption is sudden, there's usually a known risk factor such as cocaine or trauma and it's painful and it can happen at any time in your pregnancy. Abdominal pain with no known pregnancy, you want to think about an ectopic pregnancy. However, do be sure to rule out appendicitis. Uh, so you want to look at somebody with risk factors for an ectopic pregnancy, such as a history of STDs. If you have painless vaginal bleeding, you're looking at a placenta previa versus a vasa previa. So the best way to differentiate this is a vasa previa has fetal distress and requires a delivery versus a placenta previa you can wait until the bleeding gets so severe that you need to deliver. If you need another review, listen to this podcast again. Stay tuned for more ob and reproductive topics soon. Please comment if there's any topic you want to hear about. If you like this podcast, please subscribe. Any questions, comments, or concerns, you can visit the website spoonfulofsugar.org. Thank you.